This is a sponsored reading by The Critical G. Welcome to The Critical G. It is Friday, the 24th of May, 2013. And today's sponsored reading is brought to you by Carl from Victoria in Australia. Many thanks to Carl. Congratulations for winning the inaugural sponsored reading auction on eBay. If there's something you'd like me to read, please check out my eBay auctions for sponsored readings on the Critical G below. Link. Today's sponsored reading is a short story called There Will Come Soft Rains by Ray Bradbury. Ray Douglas Bradbury, born in 1920, died in 2012, was an American fantasy, science fiction, horror, and mystery fiction writer. Best known for his dystopian novel Fahrenheit 451, and for the science fiction and horror stories gathered together as The Martian Chronicles and The Illustrated Man, Bradbury was one of the most celebrated 20th century American writers. Many of Bradbury's works have been adapted into comic books, television shows, and films. For more information about Ray Bradbury, please refer to his entry on Wikipedia. Link. There Will Come Soft Rains by Ray Bradbury. In the living room, the voice clock sang, Tick tock, seven o'clock, time to get up, time to get up, seven o'clock, as if it were afraid that nobody would. The morning house lay empty. The clock ticked on, repeating and repeating its sounds into the emptiness. Seven, nine, breakfast time, seven, nine. In the kitchen, the breakfast stove gave a hissing sigh and ejected from its warm interior eight pieces of perfectly browned toast, eight eggs sunny side up, 16 slices of bacon, two coffees, and two cool glasses of milk. Today is August 4, 2026, said a second voice from the kitchen ceiling, in the city of Allendale, California. It repeated the date three times for memory's sake. Today is Mr. Featherstone's birthday. Today is the anniversary of Tilita's marriage. Insurance is payable, as are the water, gas, and light bills. Somewhere in the walls, relays clicked, memory tapes glided under electric eyes. Eight, one, tick, tock, eight, one, o'clock, off to school, off to work, run, run, eight, one. But no door slammed, no carpets took the soft tread of rubber heels. It was raining outside. The weather box in the front door sang quietly, Rain, rain, go away, umbrellas, raincoats for today. And the rain tapped on the empty house, echoing. Outside, the garage chimed and lifted its door to reveal the waiting car. After a long wait, the door swung down again. At 8.30, the eggs were shriveled and the toast was like stone. An aluminium wedge scraped them into the sink, where hot water whirled them down a metal throat, which digested and flushed them away to the distant sea. The dirty dishes were dropped into a hot washer and emerged twinkling dry. 9.15, sang the clock. Time to clean. Out of the warrens in the wall, Tiny robot mice started. The rooms were a crawl with the small cleaning animals, all rubber and metal. They thudded against chairs, whirling their moustached runners, kneading the rug nap, sucking gently at hidden dust. Then, like mysterious invaders, they popped into their burrows. Their pink electric eyes faded. The house was clean. Ten o'clock. The sun came out from behind the rain. The house stood alone in a city of rubble and ashes. This was the one house left standing. At night, the ruined city gave off a radioactive glow which could be seen for miles. 10.15. The garden sprinklers whirled up in golden founts, filling the soft morning air with scatterings of brightness. The water pelted window panes, running down the charred west side where the house had been burned, evenly free of its white paint. The entire west face of the house was black, save for five places. Here the silhouette and paint of a man mowing a lawn. Here, as in a photograph, a woman bent to pick flowers. Still farther over, their images burned on wood in one titanic instant. A small boy, hands flung up into the air, higher up, the image of a thrown ball, and opposite him, a girl, hands raised to catch a ball which never came down. The five spots of paint, the man, the woman, the children, the ball, remained. The rest was a thin charcoal layer. The gentle sprinkler rain filled the garden with falling light. Until this day, how well the house had kept its peace. How carefully it had inquired, Who goes there? What's the password? And getting no answer from lonely foxes and whining cats, it had shut up its windows and drawn shades in an old maidenly, 
preoccupation with self-protection which bordered on a mechanical paranoia. It quivered at each sound, the house did. If a sparrow brushed a window, the shade snapped up. The bird startled, flew off. No, not even a bird must touch the house. Twelve noon. A dog whined, shivering on the front porch. The front door recognised the dog voice and opened. The dog, once huge and fleshy, but now gone to bone and covered with sores, moved in and through the house, tracking mud. Behind it whirred angry mice, angry at having to pick up mud, angry at inconvenience. For not a leaf fragment blew under the door but what the wall panels flipped open and the copper scrap rats flashed swiftly out. The offending dust, hair or paper, seized in miniature steel jaws, was raced back to the burrows. There, down tubes which fed into the cellar, it was dropped into the sighing vent of an incinerator which sat like evil Baal in a dark corner. The dog ran upstairs, hysterically yelping to each door, at last realising, as the house realised, that only silence was here. It sniffed the air and scratched the kitchen door. Behind the door, the stove was making pancakes which filled the house with a rich baked odour and the scent of maple syrup. The dog frothed at the mouth, lying at the door, sniffing, its eyes turned to fire. It ran wildly in circles, biting at its tail, spun in a frenzy, and died. It lay in the parlour for an hour. Two o'clock, sang a voice, delicately sensing decay at last. The regiments of mice hummed out as softly as blown grey leaves in an electrical wind. 2.15. The dog was gone. In the cellar the incinerator glowed suddenly, and a whirl of sparks leaped up the chimney. 2.35. Bridge tables sprouted from patio walls. Playing cards fluttered onto pads in a shower of pips. Martinis manifested on an oaken bench with egg salad sandwiches. Music played. But the tables were silent and the cards untouched. At four o'clock the tables folded like great butterflies backed through the panel walls. 4.30. The nursery walls glowed. Animals took shape. Yellow giraffes, blue lions, pink antelopes, lilac panthers cavorting in crystal substance. The walls were glass. They looked out upon colour and fantasy. Hidden films clocked through well-oiled sprockets and the walls lived. The nursery floor was woven to resemble a crisp, cereal meadow. Over this ran aluminium roaches and iron crickets, and in the hot still air butterflies of delicate red tissue wavered among the sharp aroma of animal spores. There was the sound like a great matted yellow hive of bees within a dark bellows, the lazy bumble of a purring lion. And there was the patter of occupy feet and the murmur of a fresh jungle rain, like other hoofs falling upon the summer starched grass. Now the walls dissolved into distances of parched grass, mile on mile, and warm endless sky. The animals drew away into thorn breaks and water holes. It was the children's hour. Five o'clock. The bath filled with clear hot water. Six, seven, eight o'clock. The dinner dishes manipulated like magic tricks, and in the study, a click. In the metal stand opposite the hearth where fire now blazed up warmly, a cigar popped out, half an inch of soft grey ash on it, smoking, waiting. Nine o'clock. The beds warmed the hidden circuits, for nights were cool here. Nine five. A voice spoke from the study ceiling. Mrs. McClellan, which poem would you like this evening? The house was silent. The voice said at last, Since you express no preference, I shall select a poem at random. Quiet music rose to back the voice. Sarah Teasdale, as I recall, your favourite. There will come soft rains in the smell of the ground, and swallows circling with their shimmering sound, and frogs in the pools singing at night, and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire. And not one will know of the war, not one will care at last when it is done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. The fire burned on the stone hearth, 
and the cigar fell away into a mound of quiet ash on its tray. The empty chairs faced each other between the silent walls, and the music played. At ten o'clock the house began to die. The wind blew. A falling tree bow crashed through the kitchen window. Cleaning solvent, bottled, shattered over the stove. The room was ablaze in an instant. Fire! screamed a voice. The house lights flashed. Water pumps shot water from the ceilings. But the solvent spread on the linoleum, licking, eating, under the kitchen floor, while the voices took it up in chorus. Fire! 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 The house tried to save itself. Doors sprang tightly shut, but the windows were broken by the heat, and the wind blew and sucked upon the fire. The house gave ground as the fire in ten billion angry sparks moved with flaming ease from room to room and then up the stairs, while scurrying water rats squeaked from the walls, pistoled their water and ran for more, and the wall sprays let down showers of mechanical rain. But too late, somewhere, sighing, a pump shrugged to a stop. The quenching rain ceased. The reserve water supply which had filled baths and washed dishes for many quiet days was gone. Fire crackled up the stairs. It fed upon Picassos and Matisses in the upper halls, like delicacies, baking off the oily flesh, tenderly crisping the canvases into black shavings. Now the fire lay in beds, stood in windows, changed the colour of the drapes. And then, reinforcements. From attic trapdoors, blind robot faces peered down with faucet mouths gushing green chemical. The fire backed off, as even an elephant must at the sight of a dead snake. Now there were twenty snakes whipping over the floor, killing the fire with the clear, cold venom of green froth. But the fire was clever. It had sent flame outside the house, up through the attic to the pumps there. An explosion! The attic rain which directed the pumps was shattered into bronze shrapnel on the beams. The fire rushed back into every closet and felt of the clothes hung in there. The house shuddered, oak bone on bone, its bared skeleton cringing from the heat, its wire, its nerves revealed as if a surgeon had torn off the skin to let the red veins and capillaries quiver in the scalded air. Help! Help! Fire! Run! Run! Heat snapped mirrors like the first brittle winter ice, and the voices wailed, Fire! Fire! Run! Run! Like a tragic nursery rhyme. A dozen voices, high, low, like children dying in a forest. Alone. Alone the voices fading as the wires pop their sheathings like hot chestnuts. One, two, three, four, five voices died. In the nursery the jungle burned. Blue lions roared, purple giraffes bounded off, the panthers ran in circles, changing colour, and ten million animals running before the fire vanished off toward a distant steaming river. Ten more voices died. In the last instant under the fire avalanche, other choruses, oblivious, could be heard announcing the time, cutting the lawn by remote control mower, or setting an umbrella frantically out, and in the slamming and opening front door, a thousand things happening, like a clock shop when each clock strikes the hour insanely before or after the other, a scene of maniac confusion, yet unity, singing, screaming, a few last cleaning mice darting bravely out to carry the horrid ashes away, and one voice, with sublime disregard for the situation, read poetry aloud in the fiery study until all the film schools burned, until all the wires withered and the circuits cracked. The fire burst the house and let it slam flat down, puffing out skirts of spark and smoke. In the kitchen, an instant before the rain of fire and timber, the stove could be seen making breakfasts at a psychopathic rate. Ten dozen eggs, six loaves of toast, Twenty dozen bacon strips, which, eaten by a fire, started the stove working again, hysterically hissing. The crash! The attic smashing into kitchen and parlour. The parlour into cellar. Cellar into sub-cellar. Deep freeze. Armchair. Film tapes. Circuits. Beds. And all like skeletons thrown in a cluttered mound deep under. Smoke and silence. A great quantity of smoke. Dawn showed faintly in the east. Among the ruins, one wall stood alone. Within the wall, a last voice said, over and over, again and again, even as the sun rose to shine upon the heaped rubble and steam. Today is August 5, 2026. Today is August 5. 2026. Today is August 5, 2026. Today is August 5.
2026. This has been a sponsored reading on the Critical G. Many thanks again to Carl from Victoria in Australia for sponsoring this reading of There Will Come Soft Rains by Ray Bradbury. If there's something you'd like me to read, please check my eBay options for sponsored readings down below. Link! Otherwise, feel free to comment down below, hit me up on Facebook or Google+, check out my blog, thecriticalg.blogspot.com, link, like this video, make a video response, favourite if you really want to. Thanks for watching, and you've been listening to The Critical G.